Okay, so welcome to the, yes, uh, last se to the last session, last technical session, okay, on uh, censorship resistance. And the first talk will be by Cecilia Bokovic on silting, perfectly in imitated de decoy routing. Please. Hi, uh, thank you for the introduction. So this is joint work with my supervisor, Ian Goldberg, and it is related to censorship resistance. And so Slovene is our proposal for a new decoy routing system, uh, which is a class of censorship resistant systems that I'm going to talk about. Oh. Okay, uh, so first of all, just to frame the problem and talk about the threat model we're looking at. Uh, when we talk about censorship resistance, we're considering a very powerful, usually nation state adversary. Uh, that's able to monitor, alter, or block all of the traffic that exists inside its area of influence. Um, so you can imagine an example in which our adversary is perfectly fine with most of their users uh, accessing funny cat pictures on the internet, uh, but would prefer to block access to certain news sites. And so uh, what, our, what our eventual goal in all of this is to eliminate their ability to do this selective blocking um, by making it indistinguishable to the sensor uh, which site the user is accessing. And so censorship happens in many different ways in many different places, and there have been numerous measurement studies to try to determine what exactly is going on. I've listed just a few here and some of the techniques that they found. And so there is the uh, more simple techniques of blocking by IP address and also filtering by host name or doing even keyword uh, searches among host names. Um, we've also seen examples of protocol specific throttling. So for example, uh, allowing access to web pages but blocking um, SSH connections. And then there are some more advanced techniques like active probing and application layer deep packet inspection um, where the sensor is looking at the actual traffic pattern of encrypted connections to try to determine whether or not to block it um, or actively trying to detect the usage of censorship resistant systems. And so as there are many ways to conduct censorship, we also have many tools to allow us to circumvent it. And so, uh, to circumvent the blocking of IP addresses or to hide which web page uh, they're accessing, many users will use a proxy server located outside of the sensor's area of influence, and this will uh, hide their destination location, uh, but uh, so allow them to bypass the sensor's uh, simple IP blocking strategy. Um, however, what many sensors have done is to add the IP addresses of these proxies to their blacklist. And so this is something that's also been seen done on Tor. And so if you think about Tor from a censorship resistance perspective, um, it's similar to using a proxy, but you have, of course, much stronger anonymity properties. And so what the Tor project has done as a response to this is introduce this idea of Tor bridges. And so Tor bridges are entry points into the Tor network um, that, whose IPs are not publicly listed and they sort of fade in and then back out of use again as sensors detect uh, their existence and then add their IP addresses to the list of blocks IPs. Um, so it's sort of like this constantly changing uh, set of entry points into the Tor network. And so this is relatively effective. However, there are these more advanced techniques that I talked about in the last slide, like active probing and uh, looking at the pattern of traffic flowing into these Tor bridges. Um, some countries have used this to the, uh, detect these as what they are, which are entry points into the Tor network. And so as a response to this, there have many, been many proposed pluggable transports, and we can separate them into two main categories. Uh, the first category on the left here disguises traffic by making it look like something else that's allowed traffic. So we can, for example, make it look like Skype. And then the ones on the right will disguise traffic by making it look unlike anything the sensor has ever seen before. And so each of these defend against these attacks I mentioned to various extents. Um, however, it's also been shown uh, that it's, it is very difficult to mimic allowed protocols. And so we have this, the Parrot is Dead paper that looked at um, how slight differences in mimicry are actually possibly detectable by sensors. And so what we have here is a cat and mouse game where we're trying to make censorship resistance systems and mask traffic, uh, but at the same time, sensors are improving their ability to distinguish between different kinds of traffic. Okay, uh, 
And so decoy routing is another type of censorship resistant system, and it approaches this problem in a slightly different manner. Um, so from the very start of it, as opposed to trying to mimic an allowed connection, uh, what we do is we make an actual legitimate TLS connection to an allowed, so uncensored, what we call an overt site. Okay. And throughout all of this, we have enlisted the help of a friendly internet service provider. So this is someone who exists outside of the censor's area of influence, and we're combating you know, nation state censorship with nation state defenses. And what happens, and the details of this vary between uh, previously proposed systems, is that we are steganographically, and with the use of public key cryptography, uh, sharing between the client and this ISP effectively the TLS master secret for this session. And so this is going to allow this friendly internet service provider that owns a router somewhere on the path between the client and the overt site to man in the middle this connection. And so for our work, we've used a tagging procedure, the steganographic sharing similar to work done by Wistro et al. in 2011. So after this happens, uh, now the sensor, as they're expecting, sees just encrypted data that looks like it's heading to the overt site. But this friendly internet service provider is actually, whoop, sorry about that, it's a little bit slow, okay, um, is actually uh, uh, shuffling information back and forth between the client and the censored uh, covert site. And so from the censored point of view again, they see this perfectly legitimate TLS handshake happening and then they see encrypted data going back and forth between the client and they assume this overt site. Okay, and so uh, there are some attacks that have been identified on decoy routing systems. We can separate these attacks into three main categories. Uh, the first category are active attacks, and so these are attacks where the sensor is uh, changing the traffic that it sees or manipulating it, and these include things like replay attacks where they take stale uh, TCP packets and they're replaying them to try to uh, figure out whether or not the connection between the client and the overt site is actually in the TCP state that it's expecting. Um, there's also been cases where sensors have um, done a mandatory installation of root certificates on the client's machines and so they're able to man in the middle of this connection and once you can read the plain text, the game is basically over. Uh, there's also another class of attacks called uh, routing-based or RAD attacks. And uh, essentially what happens here is the sensor who is able to make routing decisions about traffic entering or leaving the country can bypass um, routers that they know are owned by ISPs that have these decoy routing systems uh, deployed on them. And so they can do this either before the connection ever happens to completely circumvent uh, this decoy router in the first place, or they can do it in the middle of the connection to detect whether or not a connection that has already started is a part of a decoy routing session. And then finally, we have these passive attacks. Uh, so as I was mentioning earlier, um, it's very difficult to mimic something or make a connection look like something it isn't. And so while the initial TLS connection is perfectly legitimate, in existing systems, after that point, the traffic will now be going to the covert site. And so it won't follow uh, the patterns that a sensor would expect to see uh, to that overt site. And so this work is primarily about addressing these passive attacks, uh, so extending this idea of uh, doing, making it a legitimate connection um, all the way through requesting legitimate uh, HTTP resources from the overt site instead of doing mimicry. Um, and we've also addressed uh, some existing attacks, and in particular, this man-in-the-middle attack that I talked about earlier. Um, of course, if a sensor can man in the middle of the connection and read the plain text, uh, we don't want then to be doing, to be providing sensor data to the client, because uh, this could potentially put them at risk. And so we've added additional protections to detect this happening, and if it happens, we make sure that the client isn't leaking the fact that they're using a censorship-resistant system in the first place. Okay. Oh, geez. Sorry, I think there's something wrong with this. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna talk about these uh, passive, in, uh, passive attacks a little bit more in detail. Um, so for traffic analysis, when we access this overt site, uh, it's gonna follow a specific pattern. And so, for example, when we access a site, we usually get this original uh, index.html page, which will be a certain size. 
As the browser is parsing this page, it's going to issue possible simultaneous connections to other resources, each of which will be a certain size. And it may also additionally request resources from other servers such as CDNs. So if we are using Funny Cats as uh, the overt site for our decoy routing session, um, what the sensor is going to see is going to deviate from these patterns. And so the resource sizes will be different. Uh, these simultaneous connections that I talked about earlier will be very difficult to mimic and will of course be of different sizes. Uh, and then finally, uh, it's going to be difficult for the client who is running the system to predict which overt sites it needs to request or, or to connect to in order to mimic what normally happens with fetching images from CDNs. And so these characteristics will distinguish uh, which site uh, the client is accessing and a sensor could look at these traffic patterns to potentially determine that the client is not actually accessing funnycats.com. Uh, next, these latency analysis attacks um, so Shukard et al. noticed uh, that the amount of time it took to load an overt page differed sin significantly when this overt page was a part of a decoy routing session as opposed to a regular access of this page. Um, and there's a good argument for why this could be the case. So remember the friendly ISP exists or owns a router on the path between the client and the overt site, which is chosen somewhat optimally. Um, however, all information from the client to the covert site, so the uh, encrypted data that the sensor is actually seeing, will be going through this friendly ISP on that path, but the uh, path between the client now and the covert site is possibly not optimal. Um, so they picked a couple different, well, they did uh, experiments on Telex and they used the overt site uh, so they saw that there was a significant difference in the latency between using a site uh, as an oversight and using it for decoy routing traffic. Okay. So our system is a, has a solution to each of these problems. And so what we do, as I mentioned before, is we extend this idea of having a uh, legitimate connection instead of just mimicry through to requesting actual resources from the overt site. And so what we're doing is we're taking censored content and we're putting them uh, in place of the resources that are being sent back from the overt site. And so we're replacing in particular uh, leaf resources like images and videos, things that won't prompt the client's browser to normally request other resources in turn. And so we've named our system Slavine, and so this is a Doctor Who reference. Uh, this is a family of aliens that are able to disguise themselves as humans by fitting inside the bodies of their victims. And so the results of these aliens, uh, I guess, yeah, uh, so what they, are able to do is appear indistinguishable visually uh, to the humans that they have attacked. So we're doing a similar thing, but uh, with data instead of real people. Okay, um, so here's an overview of how this works. So we do have the regular, uh, the tagged TLS handshake that's going to leak this TLS master secret to our friendly relay station. Um, and then we have a part of the client software called the Overt User Simulator, and this is responsible for establishing overt connections uh, to, in order to facilitate the transference of covert information. And so after this uh, TLS handshake, our system differs from existing systems. We request legitimate resources uh, from the overt site. And in the headers of these upstream requests for resources, we include the upstream data the client is sending uh, to the covert site. And so the relay station will extract this, uh, essentially act as a proxy to the covert site, and store the data, downstream data from the covert site. So now when the resources come back from the overt site, it's going to look and determine the content type. If it's something like HTML or JavaScript or a CSS, we're not gonna mess with it. We're going to allow it to continue to the client. But if it is something like an image or a video, we're going to replace it with the saved covert data. And so here's a closer look at what's happening. Uh, we have this over user simulator that's going to request a, a real resource from the overt site. And we have a, an identifier for the client, an identifier for the stream that it's using, and some SOX Connect, uh, SOX Connect request and the upstream, initial upstream data from the client. Using this data, the relay station then establishes a connection to the covert site and saves the downstream data in a queue. And uh, meanwhile, we have forwarded this get request onto the overt site. 
And so we're not actually delaying this request more than we have to. Uh, the oversight will respond with a resource, and whenever this happens, the relay station will determine whether or not it's a leaf resource, and then replace it with the saved downstream data, forwarding it to the client. And so I want to reiterate that uh, each of these resources are, of course, encrypted with this TLS master secret, and while the relay station can decrypt it and look at the contents and possibly change them, from the sensor's point of view, uh, this is just a normal encrypted connection to the overt site. Uh, so the sensor is unable to decrypt the data, but what they are seeing are a uh, traffic pattern, so packet sizes, packet timing, sizes of resources that it would normally expect from the overt site. Okay, I wanna talk about this replacement process a little bit more because uh, it's not quite as simple as simply saying determine if it's a leaf resource and replace the data. Uh, so encrypted information is sent from the overt site to the client in TLS records. And so these TLS records include a five byte record header that includes among other things the length. And then since we're using AES GCM, it's going to include a 16 byte nonce followed by the encrypted data and a 16 byte MAC. And so we can only safely decrypt this TLS record once we have received it in its entirety. Um, however, TLS records are often fragmented across packets, so there's not a one-to-one -one mapping, and there's not even a, a clean one-to-end mapping. And what we do not want to do in our system, since we don't want to add extra latency, is we don't want to wait for the packets to accumulate before we can decrypt and possibly manipulate these TLS records. And so what we need to do, uh, first of all, is figure out whether or not this downstream data we're seeing corresponds to a leaf resource. And so, of course, we can only look at the content type if we decrypt the record, and we can only decrypt the record after we've received all of it. Um, however, to determine the content type, we only need to decrypt the HTTP response header. Um, and it turns out that in a lot of web server implementations, this header is in fact included in a small TLS record that often fits inside the contents of a single packet. Um, in order to replace a resource, we don't necessarily need to decrypt it as long as we know its length, which is included in the response header and its content type. However, there are further complications when we're receiving misordered packets. And so what the relay station needs to do is it needs to maintain the HTTP state of the flow. And so I've included a simplified state machine here. Uh, there's a more complicated one in the paper. Uh, but essentially what the relay station is going to do is it's going to see these incoming packets and look at the state machine to determine at what point it's in. Uh, if it's in one of these red or shaded states, it's going to need to decrypt that packet in order to determine the content type. Um, if it's in one of the green states, it can safely replace uh, the contents of the packet even without decrypting the record. Um, there are ways to recover from an unknown state if we end up uh, unable to decrypt the contents of a record or receive a uh, partial or uh, or receive misordered packets. Um, however, even if we're able to recover, we may not be able to use that specific resource as a covert channel. We may have to wait for the next resource to come through. Okay, uh, so those are the details of our system. We do have an implementation. Uh, so we implemented this to test the fact, uh, test whether or not we were actually adding any latency. And our experiment showed that statistically we weren't. Um, so here are two experiments using Gmail as an overt site and Wikipedia. And so we ran an experiment using it as an overt site and replacing all of its leaf content. And then we ran an experiment where we just did a regular access. And so what we found is that we're not adding enough latency for a sensor to detect whether or not, this uh, whether or not the user was using a decoy routing session. Another question we have to ask ourselves is how much covert uh, bandwidth do we actually have? So we're only replacing leaf resources because if we replace something like JavaScript or HTML and that included additional requests for resources, uh, we would then be deviating from the normal traffic patterns to the overt site. And so uh, we measured the bandwidth of the Alexa top 10,000 TLS sites and we found that uh, roughly a quarter of all sites offer one megabyte or more of potentially replaceable content. So one megabyte or more of uh, these sites, or one quarter of these sites offered one megabyte or more of leaf content. Um, however, as I mentioned before, uh, we can only actually use this leaf content if we can decrypt the HTTP response header. And so we ran a couple more tests um, and we were finding that for some sites, uh, the first site we found was Facebook, we weren't getting any uh, covert data down. And so uh, the reason behind this is that Facebook uh, 
I don't know, maybe they have a custom web server implementation, uh, was including their HTTP response header um, in a very large TLS record along with the first uh, bytes of the response body itself. And so for some sites, this system works really well and we're able to replace most of the content like for Wikipedia or Yahoo, but for some sites it doesn't. And so the choice of the overt site needs to be done carefully. Okay, um, so here's a, a chart that looks at the differences between our systems and previous systems and the problems that we've addressed. Um, so we have uh, defended against previously undefended um, passive attacks such as uh, fingerprinting uh, and these latency analysis attacks. Um, we've also strengthened some of the attacks uh, seen on existing systems such as these uh, active replay attacks and as I mentioned before, the man in the middle attack. Um, However, one thing that existing systems have addressed, uh, such as tap dance and rebound that we have not in our system, are things like uh, handling asymmetry. So when we make a connection to an overt site, uh, frequently we do not pass through the same routers on the way there as the way back. And then looking at uh, inline blocking problems. So the task of the uh, relay station or this friendly ISP in processing this information and then possibly modifying traffic uh, requires a lot of hardware. And so some recent systems have addressed these challenges to deployability. Um, however, the recent systems in doing this have increased their uh, susceptibility to passive and active attacks. And so we're exploring as future work uh, some different routes towards solving these problems. And in particular, looking at some recent advances that have been made to uh, deep packet inspection or traffic shaping technologies. And so the hardware and software that uh, internet service providers are now looking at deploying. Okay, uh, and the one good thing about our system and the things that uh, we brought to the table are again, uh, this movement away from mimicry and this cat and mouse game. And we're hoping that this is a potential solution or an ending to the cat and mouse game in favor of the censorship resistor. And so we're hoping to make traffic, censored traffic as indistinguishable as possible from allowed overt traffic. Okay, uh, so to summarize, Slitheen is a new proposal for a decoy routing system, and we've looked at these previously undefended passive attacks. Uh, we do have an implementation, and we used it to test whether or not this latency we're adding was significant. Uh, and so you can access our implementation and source code online. Uh, this is something that, so we have a proof of concept and it's something that we're continuously working on improving with the eventual goal of actually deploying the system. Um, and so additionally, by design, in addition to this, these latency attacks, uh, Slitheen inherently defends against website fingerprinting attacks or any sort of traffic analysis attacks that are looking at packet sizes, packet timings, or directionality. And this is because the packet sizes and timings that you see coming back from the actual overt site, we aren't changing at all. Um, we're only changing the encrypted contents. And so the traffic is going to look identical to what a sensor would normally expect. Okay, and with that, I'll take questions. Thank you. Okay, questions? Please use the mics. Thanks for the great talk. Um, so one of the things that you're defending against is latency, right? Uh, in your analysis, did you use one user to do your test or multiple users? We used one user to do our test. Can you uh, explain a little bit how you think that will scale when, you, when multiple users, like if your system becomes popular and there's a lot of users using it? Yeah, um, so if there are multiple users using the system and so then placing strain on uh, the participating ISP, it should not uh, affect the latency that the sensor sees coming across because that latency is entirely dependent on um, the uh, timings that are coming through the overt site. Uh, so I guess, uh, right, so the potential things that could happen is if the relay station is being overloaded with this, uh, these tasks of decrypting and replacing packets, uh, what it could do is of course, like detect this and then uh, allow packets to go through unreplaced and so in their normal way. So in this situation, it would be essentially a denial of service attack, but the idea would be to prevent as much as possible the leakage of the fact that the client is using the system. Thanks. <laughs>
Hi, uh, Ethan Cicchetti, Cornell University. Uh, great talk, by the way, really interesting stuff. I'm wondering if, so a lot of websites, uh, when you're actually using them, when uh, user-generated actions will result in AJAX requests. And I'm wondering if you have any mechanism of masking the AJAX requests as they go back to the covert site while the user's actually interacting with it. Um, so are you talking about the user interacting with the covert site? Yes. Uh, so our system acts essentially as a SOX proxy. Um, like from the perspective of covert information going to and from the client and the covert site, uh, it is very similar to the relay station being a regular SOX server. And so anything you could do with a SOX proxy, this includes like web browsing, interactive web browsing, SSH connections you can do with uh, our system as well. Okay, so, so would it just essentially generate a new request to the overt site and then use the same mechanism to get the data back? Oh yeah, so we do support multiple connections to overt sites. You can okay. uh, extend your browsing session to a single covert site, and in fact you often have to, uh, because the bandwidth from the overt site, all we have are their images. And so what, it, what would happen is a user's single covert browsing session is probably spread over multiple uh, connections to overt sites. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks. Uh, I'm Yoram Mansader from UMass, great job. Um, I was wondering if you've looked at the kind of CPU load uh, on the routers uh, regarding I mean, comparing your system with previous work, because it seems like you need to do kind of keep more state and everything like that. So is it like more expensive to run your system compared to Telex, for instance? Um, I would imagine it is definitely more expensive. We have not done any of this sort of analysis yet, but it's definitely a part of future work. Um, I don't believe there's been an extensive study about this into any existing decoy routing system, in fact. And so it would be something that we do really need to do in the future. Okay. Absolutely. Vern Paxson from Berkeley. Um, I just wanted to comment on the earlier question about latency. It seems, if I understand right, your system should parallelize really nicely. So it would be really easy to roll out more hardware. There's a cost issue, which is separate. Is uh, that right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the operations we're doing that could potentially add latency are, uh, you know, simply a decrypt operation, maybe a stir stir, mem copy, encrypt. And so if we do have multiple connections that we're dealing with at once, it could be easily parallelized. You're right. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, um, Scott Cool from RunJack. Um, great talk. Uh, I just wanted to get some ideas from you about um, how you guys would handle sort of the bootstrap problem. So as I understand it. Um, a lot of the sort of models for what the overt sites would look, at, look like um, are actually held on the client side. So how would you bootstrap that? How would you make sure that it stays up to date with what the actual uh, sites themselves uh, are producing or changing over time? Uh, um, so if I understand your question correctly, uh, we are not actually holding any models of what the overt site looks like. Uh, so there's no need to update information about the shape of the overt site in terms of resources and resource sizes. Uh, we are simply responding to uh, what a regular page load to the overt site would be. And so all the information we have about the size of the packets and the timings come from the overt site itself. Uh, so there's, there's no need to uh, contain any models, no need to update the information. It's always going to be up to date. Uh, because it's what the oversight is actually returning. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks. Hi, Dave Sapling, uh, Cisco Systems. That was a really good talk, thank you. Um, it would seem to me that if the censoring actor could get a little bit of JavaScript into the code that's being loaded, they could check to see whether things like images were being uh, downloaded faithfully with a hash. Uh, have you given any thought to how you would avoid things like ad networks or potentially malicious or compromised over at sites? Uh, sort of injecting that? Do you, do you have a whitelist of overt sites, or how um, does that work? Right, um, so having a whitelist of overt sites might be a good idea, uh, because if there are uh, problems with the overt site that could potentially compromise the client, this will be a problem in our system. Um, so for things like JavaScript, we're not replacing it, so the JavaScript will run like it normally did. Um, and if this is doing to leak any, anything about the user's browsing session, it will probably leak information about uh, the user's censorship resistance activities. So yeah, uh, the user is vulnerable to any sort of cross-site scripting attacks uh, that it would normally be vulnerable to in the overt sites. Okay, I, I was thinking specifically that if JavaScript delivered from a, an ad network were to try to hash images. Uh, so Canvas hash the plain like. text of the images? Yeah, exactly. To see whether they'd been replaced. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, so it will probably detect this then. Okay. 
Um, so hopefully the ad networks, well, yeah, I don't actually know much about what ad networks do in this situation, but in that case, we would want to avoid these kinds of sites. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, maybe last question, but Hadi is getting organized already, okay? Okay. A quick uh, question also. So Matt Wright, Rochester Institute of Technology. The, um, to follow on the question about user interaction generating AJAX, um, some sites, some of the overt sites, uh, the attacker might be able to expect that there's going to be some amount of interaction uh, for some vast, uh, the, when most users go to this site, there's some amount of interaction that goes on and that I assume your system isn't currently generating. Is that something you're thinking about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we used Facebook as an example of an overt site, but if, uh, so usually what a sensor would expect if they're, well, Facebook isn't generally a good example for an overt site anyways, because it's frequently blocked. Right. Uh, but a like, sensor would expect the user to not just load the main page, but to also log into their account, maybe do some things, see a lot of traffic going back and forth. Um, our system does not emulate that. Uh, so the choice of the oversight will probably also have to depend on uh, what interacting with the oversight will actually entail. And so what would be better would be uh, like loading a, the front page of a popular image hosting site that had a lot of images embedded in it. Um, or uh, loading some more static sites, but still ones that have a lot of leaf resources available. Okay. And so it's actually future work we're looking at is to make this overt user simulator process mimic more uh, closely what the user's normal browsing habits would be. And so this includes choice of overt sites uh, as well as what you mentioned. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much again.